This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. This is the really interesting thing about blockchain games. So it kind of turns around how, how you think about game development. When you think about game development was that you make a game and then you make assets that are in the game that kind of support the economy. I think a true Web3 game completely flips the model where it starts with the assets first. I've said before that basically NFTs are the layer one of IP. All right, everyone, back with another episode of Empire. I've got Santiago back with us. He's been traveling for a little bit, but we're lucky to have him back. We've got two folks, both uh, kind of located all around the world. We've got Gabby, the legend from YGG. We've got Felix Sim from Sal Adventures. Gabby, I wanted to start with you, actually, um, and we'll kind of get definitional at the beginning. I've heard you say that play to earn is often described as this thing that is for people who don't have money, who are trading their time for money. But really your definition seems to be that play to play to earn is more about like the financialization of just the entire gaming gaming economy. Can you just get into maybe your definition of why you think crypto gaming and blockchain based gaming and play to earn is such an important concept right now? Um, I've been in the game industry for uh, 19 years now and uh, created a bunch of different games. And now worldwide, there are, I think, at least 2 billion people who are playing games. And it's something that uh, we've never really thought of as a skill to monetize. I mean, outside of a very top levels as esports, we think of it as entertainment, maybe as something you do with your friends as a way to wild the time. And with, uh, with putting a uh, blockchain inside game economy. So either with NFTs or fungible tokens, what you're basically doing is that you're putting um, economy in a way that can be traded by people for, for real value, right? And I think this is really kind of one of the most important turning points of the game industry, because now I can create a virtual economy that can easily be traded for value. And you could do it before, before blockchain, but putting your assets on the blockchain specifically means it's easy for me to trade it for Ether, for example, USDC or or whatever. So that means you can now consciously design these uh, game economies where you can have player owned economies. And I think that's why player and is so important. And obviously we're still at the very beginning of this journey. There's still a lot of experimentation on what works, how do we design sustainable tokenomics. But I think that like in the future, this play to earn movement or what we're calling X to earn, which we can get into later, is really a turning point in how value is like created and earned by people around the world. I, I am curious for, for the perhaps uninitiated people looking outside in and saying, what's going on here? Like, what what is it about what we call Web3 crypto so powerful um, for maybe not just a gamer, but just generally people that are interested in perhaps NFTs and, and just gaming? Like, what do you see that that perhaps may be interesting for, for the layman person out there? Right. I think that this the core concept of someone being able to put in their time and energy and be able to own assets, either like tokens or NFTs in exchange for their time. Um, this is something that I think is just really special. Like before, if you wanted to own crypto assets, you basically had to buy them, trade them. And uh, and now you can you can trade your time and effort. And this is not just play to earn. It could be contributing to a DAO, for example, getting tokens uh, uh, in exchange for that. So just this concept of having like owning your digital assets in exchange for value that you give to the network is, I think, something that's very revolutionary. And and for a skeptic, perhaps and I'll push back on that. Like, how is that different from you know traditional Web two models? Uh, because you you could perhaps join a company you could own you could be a part of you could be playing world of warcraft there's some value in these in these systems but how's what's a key distinction though and any any mmo has a guild right like any any every everything has in-game assets you know world of warcraft right had had i remember that we had, there was gaming guilds in world of warcraft and there are in-game assets that you could sell and like isn't that play to earn right so to yeah double down on santiago's question like how is that different yeah, guilds have existed in games for a very long time, like World of Warcraft, EverQuest, etc. Of course, you have you're not really able to own your assets there, 
Uh, one of the things that people don't know is that there was there was a big business here in uh, Asia, maybe 10, 12 years back, where uh, kids were basically like being paid uh, like very like pretty much almost nothing to play games like World of Warcraft or Diablo and amass assets and then basically sell them to people in the West. So this was actually breaking the terms of service. It's just kind of gray slash black market. But because people were willing to try trade their money for, for those assets that someone else uh, kind of played for, and this is already happening. And uh, the, the people who actually founded this were uh, Brock Pierce and Steve Bannon. Um, and Brock Pierce, like, finding like value in uh in kind of gold farming in the world of Warcraft. that's how he discovered uh bitcoin and that's what kind of set him off on his blockchain journey and now fast forward to today now you have guilds that are kind of modeled from maybe gaming guilds but have their own uh treasury assets have their own bank account basically and that was the original idea actually for ygg is that i wanted a gaming guild with with its own like treasury Felix, what is your approach on this? Because my understanding of Sal Adventures is you guys are a firm that's developing this like unique NFT focused operating system, Guild OS. And you've raised from, I think, Multicoin led your seed. And then I saw a recent round maybe last month, Alameda and Alan Howard, Brevin Howard, right? Gemini's Frontier Fund, the Winklevoss Twins, Rare Stone, Polygon Studio. These are some huge names. So what is what is your approach to the problem that's that we're talking about right now? Well, our approach is quite different because I think uh, Gabby and, and, and my um, our background, uh, our ex past experiences are also quite uh, quite different. I've never developed a game in my life. I've played loads of them, uh, but I've never developed one. Um, so I've always been playing games for fun. Uh, but my background is um, a slight uh, crossover between alternative investments. Uh, so I've worked for hedge funds, fund of funds um, for a couple of years. My interest is always in efficiency and productivity, uh, a little bit of brainwash by the Singapore government, you know. Um, so obviously we were born um, in a in a much less challenging uh, country and situation in, in Singapore as opposed to where, uh, for example, uh, Gabby uh, is, is, is from. Um, so, so I, and I think that contributes to the reason why we um, we sort of try and approach the problem differently. What, what, we, what, what, what the problem that we were trying to solve is sort of how to, how to do this um, more efficiently. And this being um, at the start, as I shared earlier, before you hit record, uh, our uh, I, I was re you know looking for something to do uh, after having you know stopped uh, the events, uh, my involvement in events business. Um, and then I came across the, that YGG video about I was like, what's, what's this YGG thing and what's this XE thing? What do you mean people are making uh, money playing games? And by the way, who paid for this documentary film? It's pretty well made, right? Um, so I was really entertained and, and I thought, you know, it, I, then that's when I started digging in a little bit more. Um, and at that time, there was only a few. It was YGG, it was, uh, I think Avocado just started as well. There was Blackpool in Australia, and that was about it, really. Um, and uh, I, I just saw that, you know, it's, it's really good uh, to, to be able to create social impact. Um, but what if we could do what if we could do this at at scale um, what if we could do this at scale the way you know again i'm from singapore i have never seen a factory with ten thousand people working in it in my life right i don't know what ten thousand people actually looks like uh, in the same place right uh, um but what i am familiar with is you know an office of 10 people doing the work of a thousand people for example and and how how did how did this country evolve into that uh, you know, the our predecessors uh, invested in infrastructure, technology, and education. So I thought, okay, I'm never going to be running the biggest guild in the world, no, no chance. And I don't know how to manage ten thousand scholars, no idea, right? Uh, but I know how, I know how to think uh, with a systems mindset. And I thought, you know, let's let's just all find our own way to contribute to this thing called play to earn. Um, and and uh, and then for me, for me at Salad, our choice was to contribute to uh, making it more efficient, making things more systematic, uh, and then approaching the problem from that angle. So the way that I'm understanding it, Felix, is that you've almost built like a stripe, right? Like almost like an operating system for some of these guilds. Whereas Gabby, maybe the analogy I might use is like, an Uber for the metaverse, where you're giving people the ability to spin up their own businesses just by having in you know the real world, it's like a car or something like that. But uh, in the metaverse, maybe it's uh, maybe it's having their own axie or something, and you're lending them that axie. Am I 
Am I way off on these analogies? How, how am I doing with those analogies? So Uber is actually one of the analogies that we use. So like we want anyone in the world to be able to find their kind of job or creative work in the metaverse. No, like whether that's like being an Axie scholar or being a content creator, being an esports athlete or like anywhere in between. So yeah, that works for me. Yeah, I think um, Stripe is probably uh, not what we, we we're building. Um, I think we're building more. So so if we look at the targets, right? So so Gabby just mentioned that you know Uber is targeting drivers, the professional esports players, the individuals to to sort of change their lives um, at a very very mass scale. Uh, for us, we're a little bit more. Um, uh, targeted in, in in the sense that we're saying let's can we build some tools that let people actually start a uh, a guild start a business uh, start um and, and then manage and then and then scale right so i think we're both sort of trying to address the same problem um but the product if i may that with that we're that we're building um, are targeting sort of different levels um of of users so you know ygg would and should always have um, the most uh, number of people in its ecosystem, in its community, because of the model um, that Gabby is is picking, uh, has picked. And, and for us, um, we would have a lot of very targeted um, users, targeted uh, community members in, in, our, in our ecosystem. Uh, but again, eventually, I think it all flows, the river flows the same way. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to sort of make this world a better place through uh, Play to Earn. Felix, well, like from the guilds that you work with, what, the, what is the like size range, I would say, of, uh, of the guilds that uh, you are working with at the moment? So right now we're doing close beta for for Guild OS, right? So so we have two sort of two products. That, well, three we've got three PLS that were that that we've um, that we've launched. Um, we've sort of rebranded our guild and we call it Apollo Squad now. Um, and and then the second pillar, as we've been talking about, is Guild OS. And then the third pillar is uh, is the Academy, Solid Academy. Um, and for Solid Academy, we work with all size guilds. Uh, for Guild OS, it's still very close beta. Um, we are testing it because we are sort of managing private keys, right? So, so we just want to make sure that the system perfectly works before we open it up. But guilt size, um, the sweet spot for us is guilt size of, uh, let's say, 100 to 500 scholars um, type of guilds. Not because the system can't take it, as you obviously uh, know, we can always scale things up. Um, but sort of like the, the way we're approaching this is... I think uh, pre uh, earlier we, we were chatting before Jason hit record is um, about these tooling projects, right? Uh, people building tooling projects, DAO tooling, and then guild tooling, and then no code tooling, and all sorts, right? Um, how how do you how do you how do you build such a project? How do you scale such a project? How do you impact more people? Um, and, and I one hundred percent agree. Um, and and uh, at the start, we we're thinking like, how are we going to go to market, right? How are we going to get enough people to actually use this? Um, and, and that's why uh, when we launched Guild OS or when we announced Guild OS, we launched Salad Academy at the same time. Because um, I think uh, tools, um, again, to getting building a, building a product, building a tool um, that needs, uh, that, that gets more that gets people to use uh, and stick to it's uh, it's tough right and and i think um you need to sort of create the education part of it to teach not just about the game so right now on uh, seller academy um it's really about you know how to play xc properly how to uh, you know how to play mindset the and then now mod is coming up with v2 and then we're launching how to uh, threaten arena cyborg and all that kind of courses but that's very game specific um but that's just sort of the first uh, layer but let's actually go there because i'm curious to get both of your perspective on when you think about playing a game it's it's meant to be fun and it's meant to be a hobby. But now we're sort of saying, wait a minute, no, 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 you can make money off of this and make it your full-time job. And look, sometimes very lucrative, right? At, at its peak of SLP, which is the native token that people earn while playing Axie, you know, people are making multiples of what you could be making in these local economies. You're talking about in the Philippines and Venezuela and in, in, in other places. The game is hard to play, I think. It's difficult to understand. It's a battler game, but it's not as intuitive, right? It's not like Mario Kart. You, you, you pip the controller. Or most of the games that you see on, on, when you, on the long-range flight, you know, it's super easy, right? But it's, it's hard, right? And so there's been criticisms where people say gaming is not meant to be a full-time job. Once you make it a full-time job, then it loses a lot of the kind of the elements. 
And so it puts into question, where are we headed as an industry? Like, is this just a very small subset, a phenomenon, if you will, a fad that will go away? Or do you see this as being a totally new way of just kind of building games, creating like employment opportunities? Is it here to stay? Is it sustainable? So I, I would love to get both of your perspectives on that, especially because you're, I think, two people in the industry that are very close to how scholars, people that are playing these games actually perceive it. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. There's a lot of people who will basically just suffering a lot of cognitive dissonance and saying like games are meant to be for entertainment G games are supposed to be for fun and now when you're playing games and earning money then they're not fun anymore and <laughs> to that like i would say like like who made you the, the kind of gatekeeper of what games should and shouldn't be <laughs> right of course games should be for entertainment and that's not going to go away okay. but you know what's fun what's fun is being able to learn a skill with my friends and winning together like think think of DeFi summer right like shit was hard like i like most of these concepts went over my head and like the only thing i could do to learn it was basically chuck some money in and hope like i i got out alive but like that was fun that was that was a lot of fun like even doing yam was fun even though it was such a kind of like headache uh trying to figure out if i was going to lose all of my money or not so like People are thinking of fun usually in the sense of like me being immersed in the world, thinking about like forgetting all of my problems and then being in this like game world where I have a specific set of so problems to solve, then I've won a game. And sure, that kind of gaming is not going to go away. But what we're seeing here is that now you are creating these virtual economies where people can basically put value in and you can also get value out and you're doing that in a game environment and i think that the that 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 market that we're starting to build now is actually going to be larger than games as entertainment before we go to you felix i'm curious when someone hears you 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 bring money you put value in you take money out, you you take value out how do you manage that balance? Like who, who wins and who loses in, in these systems? A lot of times people think in win-lose terms. I tend to think a lot, a lot of what is happening in Web3 is win-win, but curious, is there anyone here that is losing? Right. No, that's that's a really good question. I think there's also a lot of narrative right now, for example, about scholars being extractors. And honestly, I really hate that narrative. And like they're assuming that if you're a scholar coming in, you're being provided an asset, you're taking money out, and you're actually not contributing anything to the network. And I really push back against that narrative because, first of all, I think most of the really good guilds um, and uh, you can see this from the Focus of South as well, are into education, right? Like most of the people that you see are coming in, they're educating people not just to play Axie and take money out, but like using crypto, Web3, owning their own assets, um, just the basics of for personal finance. So some of the best people that are working in our guild actually started out as scholars. So we're doing kind of mass education on Web3. And I think that's something that, yeah, Felix and I can both uh, can both agree on. And of course, if you have a virtual economy, you need to take, uh, like there needs to be more money coming in and coming out. And I think this is the field in tokenomics and play to earn that is still kind of really evolving with the SLP model, the volatility, and what, most people don't really understand about uh, the volatility of reward tokens is that there is always going to be an order magnitude more trading volume on the token on the speculation side rather than what your game economy can can take that's just a fact of crypto like no matter how well designed your game economy is there's going to be more volume on your token in binance if you do your job well like you know take a look at slp for example it can probably take only so much maybe a few million dollars per day volume on breeding but there's 150 million dollars a day like uh, trading on button and that's just a fact of crypto and so now there's a lot of kind of hand wringing and finger pointing who's extracting money but it's actually all just tokenomics to me in the same way that DeFi tokenomics are changing and of course games have to be fun you have to take put more more money in take more money out but we are learning tokenomics that are kind of going to evolve over time and as in every new game that comes along we're actually seeing this 
uh, improve bit by bit. Um, is speculation bad? Like, because th this thing, like v a lot of people in the industry, like, okay, I think speculation without utility, without underlying like useful things is, is kind of like pointless. But crypto has gone through this phase where like you now have, m most people like, are like, we're stuck in the 2017 era. We're like, okay, spe pure speculation. Now you, you still have speculation. You need to have kind of speculation because that captures your attention. It captures your imagination. But now you have utility. Like there are games, there are applications that are being built. I think that's a key distinction, but I'm curious, like is, is, is that bad? Because I don't think speculation, I think speculation is a necessary ingredient for any industry. So for me, actually, and this is the challenge to game designers, right? Like, it's like asking, are waves bad? Are typhoons bad? They are, they are there, right? And actually the key is knowing that, knowing that speculation is going to be part of your game, treating it as a mechanic and trying to, like knowing it'll exist and designing around it is actually, I think, what will make a successful player in game work, not kind of like, either pretending it doesn't exist or maybe not having rewards because if you don't have token rewards there's no sp speculation then you're not going to have network effects so now like people are trying to figure out oh maybe we shouldn't have tokens at all and i think people are just getting the wrong point of it it's just really understanding that this is going to evolve over time and i i think we'll just hit on an optimum model with enough tries at it felix on to you now um so I am curious what you're seeing on the scholar side. See, this is why we focus on the infrastructure and education and not try and pretend that we know how to de design tokenomics for games. Um, because as Gabby mentioned, it is still very early days. And there are a few topics uh, that, that you guys were uh, chatting about that also resonates with me. So firstly, um, the question about uh, should games be fun or should, should, should it be for profit or something? I mean... I, I think it can be for both, right? And then most people who play games play more than one game anyway. Um, but, you know, the whole purpose for this for this podcast is to talk about play to earn. Um, and no matter how crypto twi Twitter tries to twist it to play and earn and play then earn and play whatever it is, you know, people are just trying to make some money here. Yeah, I, and we, we have to call a spade a spade. And, and this is something that I personally um, <clears throat> find very... Uh, disturbed, uh, slightly disturbed when I see on, on Twitter uh, some guild owners, you know, just constantly trying to do social impact, social impact, social impact, and then uh, just keep talking about how much they've given away, giving away, giving, giving away to scholars. Great, all that, but where is the model that sustains this entire giving away thing, right? Um, and that was one thing that frustrated me that said, this, this is not sustainable. You cannot be raising money forever. There has to be some kind of uh, model beneath that giving away stuff, right? And what, what are, why are they giving away um, you're giving away because there are people in the world who are willing to exchange time uh, for money and thanks to COVID uh, or no thanks to COVID a lot of people uh, around the world including in Singapore have lost their job um, and play to earn just happened to be there and I think if COVID never happened play to earn would never have happened because there was just it just needed this huge catalyst to stop the world for just one heartbeat uh, and then people started to realize that hey hang on there's this crypto thing it's crypto summer and then this player and things coming in and again great video from RGG people get inspired everybody uh, started flocking in right but they're not flocking in because it's fun flocking in they flocked in at the start because it makes them money uh, because mm -hmm. they lost their job uh, I think very straightforward and I don't think uh, any of that has changed I think one thing that I, I, I really enjoyed um, uh, reading about is um, is sort of like about re-globalization of sort, or at least uh, making the world uh, a, a slightly more uh, even playing field. I mean, whether you're from the United States or you're from India or you're from Singapore or Philippines, if you're earning you know like 300 SRPs per day multiplied by 30 days and you're playing diligent diligently, um, you're making this exact same amount of money, right? Whether the, the SRP was up or down, you're exactly the same, which is something that I I, I really uh, like because now it is. Finally, fair, um, you know, and then uh, I think that's also the reason why uh, usually uh, most of the players come from from low lower income uh, countries, but they are supported um, by players with high income in those countries as well, or by guild owners, uh, but with high income in those countries, and also guild owners from other countries. Um, now, the note of. Uh, guilds slash players being extractors. I am a hundred percent with you, Gabby. Uh, that's another thing that pisses me off when I when I read it on on crypto Twitter. Right? I think the only reason why, um, well, 
I guess when games uh, talk about uh, guilds being extractors, value extractors, uh, or scholarship model being value extractors, then that is an absolute red flag for every single guild slash investor, right? Um, because it's just, it very, very clearly just tells me that these guys don't know what they're doing. They don't know the <laughs> the game they're in, pun intended. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, blaming somebody else. It's just so typical human behavior, right? When 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 you sort of don't know what to say, you just sort of point your finger at someone else and say it's his fault. Um, it's not, I think, uh, guilds, uh, what, what do games need, right? If uh, removing the blockchain part or removing the crypto part of, of games, games need players, period. Without players, games are worthless, right? Um, uh, guilds bring players, uh, scholarship model brings more players uh, and, and, and players help the game grow. I think the onus is on the game to uh, either unponzify themselves uh, or figure out a better way uh, to to design uh, rewards. Uh, I think you know not giving a reward then sort of makes it pointless to play that game, especially if you say that you play to earn or play and earn. But yeah, definitely not extractors. Empire is brought to you by Paraswap, which just reached a whole new level in the DeFi game. Paraswap started as a DEX aggregator, which for those who don't know, it's like a Google flights or an Expedia for swapping crypto. You would obviously never just go directly to an airline's website. Uh, same thing with crypto. You would never go directly to an exchange uh, to trade or to swap. You'd go to Paraswap. Why? Because they aggregate liquidity from more than 60 different sources uh, to get you the best prices and the most efficient gas transactions. Now, Paraswap, obviously still the best aggregator out there, but now there's more. They now have staking, they have yield farming. Uh, there's this one feature that I love. Uh, it shows you exactly how much money Paraswap saved you on your last trade. They're now on five different blockchains. They've got Ethereum, Binance, Polygon. They recently added Avalanche and Phantom. So it's really simple. If you're an Empire listener, if you are new to DeFi or you're a power user of DeFi, really anybody, if you're dabbling in DeFi markets, you have got to try Paraswap. Their new staking and yield farming products are a game changer. They've taken DeFi to the next level with really one of the first mature DeFi products that I've ever seen. So head on over to paraswap.io. That is paraswap.io and start swapping, trading, staking, and so much more today. Gabby, you brought up a really interesting point earlier on the episode, which is DeFi Summer. Like DeFi Summer felt some of these, pro like when I was farming Yam, it felt like a game. Like it yep. was fun. Uh until there was a bug in the rebasing contract. That, that was still fun, I guess. It was, it was exhilarating. Uh, and the entire DeFi summer was fun. Uh, and some of these some of these protocols were, you know, in, in some capacity, like gamified finance. Uh, which, Felix, I think you're absolutely right. It, uh, the games that I have look at and I've invested in, candidly, are the ones where just have really good game lore. And, and our guy, it's, a, it's a fun game. And I think, to, to, we're all, I think we can all agree on this notion that the game, you you know, no amount of token design and financial engineering will make up for a crappy product, whether it's a DeFi protocol or a game. What's really exciting now is that Axie's captured the imagination of so many Web2 developers. We had Justin Count on the episode or earlier. We've had other people say, like, this is real. Real talent is coming into the space from all kinds of Web2 companies that had a high opportunity cost to build a web three game. Like for instance, I, we're going to have Brooks later on, uh, in a, in a, in a couple of weeks, he was like one of the top guys that was behind avatar, the movie, like with James Cameron, like you talk about someone like that coming into the space to build a game. Yeah. I mean that, that to me doesn't feel like bullshit. I mean, there's some real elements here that you're fixing the traditional games, whether you're candy crush or what have, or world of Warcraft. I mean, Vitalik started in many ways was the inspiration to come in and build something that he got rugged playing World of Warcraft and then decided to build Ethereum. So like, um, oh, Axie yeah. inspired, I think just a whole batch of like really smart game developers to move from web two to web three. And one of the big, biggest reasons for that is that the business model of free to play was really squeezing, um, creative independent developers where they had to pay more and money, more and more money to Facebook for user acquisition, just to be able to get downloads and then 
like you'd retain 40% of these players on day one. And there was really no community, not in the sense of like where Web3 starts with the community. And that's what excites people. Like one of the things that Axie did really well was basically scale up the community from like 15,000 in January 2021 to like around 3 million DAU at the end of the year and of course there were bumps along the way but it was the community model that carried it along without paying a dime of user acquisition to facebook or google or everyone else and they they weren't on steam they weren't on the app store and then they were earning something like somewhere between five to at the peak 40 millions a day on the marketplace um, and game developers took a look at that and said, hey, the game is open again. Like I can actually make a game and not have to give away like m m an arm and a leg to these gatekeepers and that opened the floodgates for talent to go into Web3. Axie obviously had an amazing year in 2021. The it ran up from like two, three, four dollars at the beginning of the year to $160 at the peak. For AXS, but now I yes. see For AXS, right. And like now the price yeah. is down to like 45. And then same with like SLP big run up and now it's down. So when I see something like that, and like, again, my, my small brain understanding of this is that the Axie economy is primarily based on new user growth because uh, every new user has to, or maybe this is an old model, but has to buy three Axies. So the breeders were making a lot of money. How does this kind of economic cycle stay up when this growth and like the price slows? Do you, do you see what I'm saying here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And definitely it was a growth loop and probably one of the best that's uh, ever invented. But uh, at the end of the day, there has to be different reasons for you to keep on buying assets. So right now, for example, apart from breeding, like you may want to get certain genes, certain aesthetics, you might want to buy the collectible axes and now uh, there's like multiple game modes are coming so version 3 of axie gameplay origin is coming soon it has more of that like dynamic real-time gameplay where you know you're not waiting for your turn to end before uh you're you're doing your moves there is land gameplay that's going to be uh released sometime in in the future and this is the really interesting thing about blockchain games. So it kind of turns around how, how you think about game development, where when you think about game development was that you make a game and then you make assets that are in the game that kind of support the economy. I think a true Web3 game completely flips the model where it starts with the assets first. I've said before that basically NFTs are the layer one of IP. So think about it in that way. Like you have your three axes, you have V2 battles. Next week, maybe there's V3 origin battles. Next month or next year, there's like land gameplay and I st still can use these three axes. That's what's most exciting to me is that it layers like different kinds of gameplay experiences, which may have different economies on the same set of assets that you own. The problem on the reward token is very specific, right? So for example, you have an economy that's worth a thousand dollars and then a uh, hundred people are are playing it then they they're getting like ten dollars each and the problem is that people think that the the time they are playing the game the value is worth ten dollars but that doesn't scale when you're at a thousand people a hundred thousand a million people so the problem with the current state of like reward token tokenomics specifically is the sense that like oh my time was worth this much money but that doesn't scale because as the number of people kind of in the game economy grows the the rewards don't scale linearly with that so now people are sharing a smaller reward pool and if you have token emission that is basically linear that means that the token price goes down so i think that the way that the rewards should be uh, kind of uh, structured and presented to players is uh, something very different from what is happening now. So that's what I think actually the the root of the the problem with reward tokens in. And people are like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have re reward tokens anymore. But that's actually the best way of doing user acquisition. It's just that you can't really promise a player that like their time in the game is worth like X amount of money. So whether you're doing it via like reward pools or seasons. Um, I think there are many different ways to solve this that people are experimenting on. But yeah, that specifically, I think is why uh, like uh, there's a lot of problems now with reward tokens. 
But I think to address that, right, is is really um, let's say they were play they were a player and they were just a scholar, um, rather than I'm just thinking out loud, really, you know, like uh, rather than just go on uh, crypto Twitter to to bitch about, uh, you know, like used to be earning twenty thirty dollars a day, uh, just clicking some buttons, right, and then now I'm not, um, I'm only earning like two dollars a day because everything has crashed and all that. I mean, think about it. Right? What if what if they um, and this is I think the this is all like the game of life right this is the reality of life you 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 start off uh, in life and you work on a shitty job that you hate and you get paid nothing right um and then you you keep sort of uh, increasing your your knowledge increasing your experience and then you level up in life so um the way i see it is that i think it's great to you know obviously have loads of scholars come in and then have scholars um start their level one in play a uh, game five life for example right um and entertain this thought what if they uh, if you know obviously they start to realize that their time is worth a lot more than that and but they've gained more knowledge um what if uh, then you know they could say let's say take a course on how do you actually start a guild um raise money or borrow money how do you how do you structure stuff financially how do you build a guild business right um and then uh, have a structured piece of content uh, or course that teaches them how to do this um and then they're completely independent like they literally could you know this is how you get friends and family's money mm -hmm. and this is how you pitch this is how you run it this is how you like this is what you should not do don't they're teaching anyone. them how to run a business right <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So, so that's yeah. the focus that we're, uh, that's the education that 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 I was sharing uh, about right earlier, where we're saying it's great. Uh, so, so scholars want to be managers, but how? How? It's easier. Everyone wants to start a business, man. Yeah. It's how, how many have really started one? Yeah. Yeah. That's just such a good point, Felix. Because I th I think uh, it can get lost. Even I remember growing up, my parents were like, "What's the point of you playing a game?" And then of course, there's like different studies that show, you know there are certain skills that you develop depending on the game you play. But I love playing games. I love poker. Uh, not, I mean, of course, everyone I think knows at this point that I'm a DJ, but like, you know, I, I think like there are certain life skills applicable, not only in the metaverse, but in the meat space that like you develop by playing games, like strategy and coordination and, and, and communicating with people. And I think like that's lost on people, which is what's the whole point of just playing a game? I'm like, well, you know, first of all, I think more and more of the world is becoming digital. We're spending more time in the metaverse, which, and I want to pause there and just get your interpretation of, of what is the metaverse for you? Uh, like, why now, right? The metaverse, the concept of the metaverse has existed, like, since Ready Player One. Like, it has been, it's like AI. It, it's like AI. It's like VR. These are concepts that are not new. They've been around for a while. But I think there is a reason why it is front and center now. But I am curious to get both of you guys' perspective of how you think about this whole metaverse, which is, there's a whole jargon out there, but let's just kind of put it into perspective of why it's so important at this moment in time. All right, I'll take a stab at it. For me, the metaverse is the virtual world where you can uh, basically do things with other people and then uh, do actions that uh, gain you some form of permanent value. And this is very abstract. I'm not saying it's AR or VR or even crypto, but the big difference why I think Metaverse is enabled in Web3, for example, um, was because like you could do a lot of things in a virtual world before, or but like there's no there's no permanence to any of the uh, the things that you do inside a role playing game, for example. And being able to store that value permanently, I think, is what enables the the metaverse. And it's not one particular game, or it's not one particular virtual world, and it's not going to be in one particular chain. I think what re what is really exciting is the concept of an open metaverse where I can take my identity whether like pseudonymous or real and then i can take the value that i have the things that i own and be able to jump to different worlds with it and do different things in it and that doesn't need to be game like i think that twitter is actually one of the earliest representations of of the metaverse especially now that you have like nft profile pictures i mean twitter is just a lo-fi version of the metaverse right I think that, uh, so I see it again uh, from a very different lens. Uh, I think the metaverse is, is, uh, is a new uh, economy. I think it is, the new, it, it is a new way of work. It is a new way of commerce, a new way of entrepreneurship. Um, I don't 
see it as sort of like a Ready Player One kind of metaverse. I, I think um, I see it as a it, it's a new economy. That's how I see it. Yeah, I think the key prop the key property is at least the way I think about it. And Gabby and Felix, you both have pointed to this earlier on is this concept that you can for the first time ever have like digital property um, and and you can monetize so many different things around that attention being number one like you're playing a game yeah okay it's it's i think like it's not to say the web 2 companies weren't able to monetize attention i think a lot of them did but it was just very concentrated and very few people um user aggregators like facebook and google and and youtube and the the distribution of of that monetization model was very unequitable meaning very few people like artists were getting paid nothing and so let, let's turn to that, if you don't mind. Like, tell me about how you, what's your relationship with a scholar? So like they play, you help them. Like when I first downloaded Axie, just to put it in perspective, it, it's kind of cumbersome, right? It's not a mobile app. It, it's not in your console. I, I still remember playing Nintendo 64 and you had to like blow into the cassette and be like, and like tap it and like put it on and it was glitchy. It, it, this is worse. You know, like you had to download a client and your computer and, you know, it was, it was a whole rigaroo. Gabby, can you just explain kind of the whole econ, like the whole interaction, but with like players and breeders and scholars and then where like a guild comes in here? I think that's a great place to go, Santi. And, and just on top of that, also maybe get to at some point how you share the value that is being created between you, sure. you the guild and the scholar. So in Axie Infinity, you need three Axie NFTs to play the game. And then so you, you play the game and then you go into the multiplayer arena and when you win games, you earn SLP tokens. So anyone who owns their Axie and wins games, you earn SLP tokens, which are basically points on the database until you sync them on chain, uh, upon which like basically becomes tokens that are that go into your blockchain wallet. Um, the innovation that the community did, this is actually not something that SkyMavis did itself, it was something the community found out, was that I can give somebody my uh, my account, my username and password, they could log in, access my assets, play the game, and earn SLP, but they couldn't run away with the SLP or the axes themselves because they didn't have access to the underlying private key. And this was how the scholarship program in Axie was born, where people who had a lot of excess axes, maybe they were breeding a lot of axes to sell in the marketplace, they started offering these accounts to players who wanted to come in and play and earn money, but didn't have the money to buy the axes themselves. So that was how uh, scholarships were born. And YG was born on top of that with myself and my co-founders, like wanting to scale that model pool capital from investors and basically blanket the whole globe with uh, with assets, with axes and other NFTs so that people could access this these kind of virtual world economies and be able to to earn from them. Our relationship with scholars are slightly different um, again. Uh, so we started as uh, with a guild, which we still run. Um, so on that front, the uh, the relationship with scholars are, are very similar. Um, but now we also have evolved as a project uh, and uh, by way of direction, again, um, the relationship with, with scholars is, they may not even be with our own scholars. It could be with scholars from other guilds that want to learn uh, how to play other uh, games that are on mainnet, which obviously then allows them to earn as well. And many of these games are not that expensive to enter. So, you know, they probably save some of their scholarship money and then uh, they try and get into other games on their own. Um, so that's what we are trying to encourage for scholars to become uh, independent after they have gotten, uh, you know, the the experience um, and and the help, the initial help. Um, how how do they then get up to the to the next level um, through uh, by learning more games and then you know investing their own money um, into into these games and being independent um, and then also uh, once they have gotten to let's say level two, then hopefully level three, they will be able to start uh, their own guild. Um, go through more advanced uh, courses, more advanced training, uh, where I would also personally share my experience, right? Where how you know, we got inspired 
uh, by by YGG, and then how how I decided to do things uh, differently, how I approach problems differently, how how did I think of these problems, right? So share these things, and and that is sort of like the angle that we're heading towards. And then if they so decide to start a guild, um, it's obviously going to be easier for them because they they're still very small to start with a tool um, that lets them. Uh, manage all their assets uh, and their, their own scholars across different games. Uh, so that's sort of how we are approaching um, this relationship with scholars. Yeah, so for us, we were called a guild of guilds and a DAO of DAO. So YGD itself is not one guild. There's over 30 different uh, scholarship or community managers that have their own sub guilds. So these aren't employees or team members of YGG. These are actually community managers that have proven that they can kind of handle uh, like scholars and train them and they have access to our Axie assets and they have access to our platform. So now most of these uh, like smaller guilds, their problem is really like they don't have the capital to scale up the asset base. So we remove that problem by providing the assets to them. And these community managers, basically all they really have to do is recruit and train players in their sub guilds. So YGG is not one guild, there's like over 30 guilds now. And then we've created different sub DAOs that do different things. So for example, we have the geographical sub DAOs that cover the rest of Southeast Asia, YGGC, YGG India or IndieGG all of our Latin America. And then there's also game sub DAOs that manage a particular group of assets in the game and the players are doing the governance um, around that. So Gabby, we, we made the analogy earlier to, to Uber, but when I think about what you guys are really building here, it's like a Berkshire Hathaway for the metaverse, which is, you know, guilds seem like this really complex thing, but really what you're just doing is you're just cash flow investing, right? You're investing in players who are producing assets and that, therefore produces cash flow. Am I simplifying this too much? That's uh, that's definitely one way to look at it. Like we do acquire a lot of assets that produce yield, which attracts players. But for us at the end of the day, it's not like the assets are valuable, but they're valuable in so that uh, we are attracting players that can then kind of go into the network. So the way we view it is that we are increasing the network effect with different kinds of things that people can do, whether it's scholarships, whether um, it's like forming DAOs in different games. And now we've uh, we've invested into DAOs that do like move to earn, create to earn, learn to earn. And people are going to do this like within the DAOs that are kind of uh, like affiliated with YGG. So the thing that we're looking for at the end of the day is really the compounding of the network effects of people who are looking for jobs to do in the metaverse. Felix, I think you mentioned you guys were in eight games. I might've got that incorrect. Gabby, you mentioned you're in like 30 plus games like Sandbox and League of you know, Kingdoms and Star Atlas and Alluvium. And obviously you both started with Axie. How do you guys, putting on Felix almost like your hedge fund manager hat now, like how do you guys figure out what games to go into? Are there metrics that you look at? Are the, is it the developers? Is it the users? Is it the tokenomics? Like what, do, what are you looking at? And again, try, maybe almost putting on your investor hats here. Uh, yeah, for, for, for us, it's uh, if you're investing into the assets and so we don't think like a Berkshire Hathaway, uh, we're probably trying to think a little bit more like a BlackRock where we have to sort of ge keep generating uh, these positive uh, yields and then obviously then build software like, you know, what BlackRock has. They've built Aladdin, uh, they use it internally and then they start to let other asset managers around the world use. Obviously, they're still the biggest users of their own software. Um, so trying to build towards that as opposed to Berkshire, um, simply because I'm a lot more impatient, I think, um, to, to sort of see results. Uh, but uh, for sure, there's got to be a positive ROI. There has to be a positive community. Gabby said that a hundred times, right, in this on this pod, 100% agree. Um, the, the, I think the, the founders of the games need to be very clear what they're building. Um, I find it very strange if someone thinks that they can build um, you know, a triple A game uh, in, in, in one year or in 18 months and then bring that onto mainnet. And it's just, it's just not going to happen. Right. So usually for, for, so for salad, um, we don't invest 
um, unless uh, unless the game is very very clearly uh, on its way to launch a testnet at least or if it's on its already on testnet on its way to uh, launch on mainnet uh, so we're typically later to um, the party uh, but we're still there before you know the entire crowd sort of turns uh, turns up um, and then if the game is already on mainnet then obviously we would buy a lot more assets and and then uh, send them out to to scholars and train them so that we can generate um, a more uh, a more positive yield so so that's how that's how we do it how do you do it Kevin? okay uh, so for us uh, there's a four-man team that basically acts almost like an early stage fund and takes a look at a lot of these games and we like working with founders as soon as possible because there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes towards us when we actually like buy assets in the game and when we buy assets we prefer we're weighted towards the NFTs first because it's our community that uses these NFTs and earn earn sealed from them of course if we buy that we we want some exposure to the governance token as well because you can capture the value there but we're not a VC um, like we were a guild and that's the value that we bring so when we talk to these founders we help them actually shape like you know how are the guild mechanics is there an asset lending model how are you doing rewards is it single token dual token tri token whatever how do you uh, kind of design for the sustainability of the reward? So we try to get in as early as possible, seed round if possible, and help the founders think through these problems that come with basically creating a player and game. And um, all the way when a game launches, of course, we uh, like we are there on launch. We bring our scholars to the game. We have a network of like over 13 content creators that could be streaming the game. Um, right now, we have an esports team that is playing Axie, but that would be in other games as well. So we want to make sure that the games that we are covering are successful, basically from seed round to community. Yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, can you talk from from your vantage point? I think all of us are, are seeing a lot of new games that are going to launch this year, uh, a lot of which are really immersive, uh, much different than Axie. Um, what are some of the um, what are some of the games that are most exciting to you that you've seen? Um, uh, maybe not the, if you don't want to single out one or, or, or don't have to, but maybe just conceptually, like what are things that are you're really excited about? Right. So um, the games that have a lot of different uh, deep economies, so role playing games, strategy games that are coming in, like for example you're seeing more and more like MMO like games come in where, for example, the guild can own a kingdom and then the kingdom, there's some land. And then with the land, you can build buildings. The buildings produce resources and then players come in and farm resources. And then there are people who are crafting things that can turn the resources into weapons, armor or different things. Like you're seeing a lot more sophisticated economies like that come in. And like I don't want to talk specific games, but um, I think this the level of sophistication of what like play to earn like NFTs look like is going to be just really different. Like one two years from now, we've we bought assets in over thirty games, and honestly, most of them aren't out yet. But starting like in the next few quarters, I think you're gonna see just a lot of sophistication um, in in the new games that are coming out. For us, we see the same thing as well. Um, for sure, a lot of MMORPG style games are coming up, um, and and uh, really looking forward to uh, to see some of them actually launch because it's super hard, as uh, we all know, to to launch a game, let alone an MMO. Um, MMO is like the hardest type of game to to ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, sure. yeah, it's so tough. Um, I personally like first person shooters, so any FPS games. Um, so we sort of um, uh, know are close with two uh, that's built on Solana. Um, so so FPS games, uh, my personal favorites, uh, card games um, like poker. Um, again, also another DGen uh, right here. Um, those I think would be would be uh, would be doing quite well as well. I think actually games. Um, I'm just thinking. People tend to say that you either you have to design games to be fun, uh, but fun is very subjective. Um, I think game studios, game designers, to try and design games to be addictive, um, as opposed to being fun, right? So it could be 
not so fun, but just super addictive. For example, like you play um, and then you win, I don't know, six times and then you, you, you lose six times and then you win the seventh time and then you lose again. And then, you know, you got to play f five times and you're like, I'm too games away from actually winning and then you, you you keep sticking to the game maybe not because it's fun but because it's just so addictive you just don't want to lose um and you know that you're just gonna win if you keep playing um i don't know how to design uh addic addictive uh games uh but i i think uh, if anybody who's watching this part once is thinking of designing a, a game or um or a blockchain game i think uh they need to really understand how uh, people, uh, us as humans, uh, how about about addiction. They need to understand the psychology, the psychology of addiction. They need to understand how to make something so addictive that people just keep coming back. And then I think that would solve a lot of problems because whether the tokens, uh, the token price is up or down, it's hard to fight addiction, right? Smoking, drinking, or devices, poker. Um, it's it's hard, right? So so I think if if um, any game that is able to instill the human nature of addiction uh, is going to win big. Let me get your guys' take on addiction, actually, Felix, uh, going off of that and almost tying it back into game psychology. One thing I'm noticing is that you're having more and more gaming guilds and also just investment funds and like large institutional buyers come into these games and start purchasing in-game assets, right? So both the in-game assets could be NFTs, it could be metaverse land. Does this kill the experience for gamers especially when and obviously there's two different models here where you can just buy things because they're rare but but like when i start thinking about buying things needing a lot of money to buy things let's say like a super sword or a spaceship if you can only afford a spaceship for fifty thousand dollars and the spaceship means you're going to do better at the game well now you're ruining the gaming experience for like the everyday person so do inst large institutional buyers coming into the and like investment funds coming into these games does that does that hurt the game flow okay really good question the answer is um you should really uh segment the type of gameplay you're doing with like what the core loop is and what the meta game should be and like here's the example i give like what is the core loop of football? There are two teams that are kind of throwing a ball around, trying to tackle each other and get the ball to a finish line. That's the that's the like core loop, right? And you can be a really good football player, and now, but you could be the owner and you like you're playing a different meta game. You buy a team, maybe you own an arena. You're trying to get TV rights. You're trying to make money off of it, and that gameplay loop is very different from you trying to kind of toss a ball around and trying to hit an arbitrary goal so that's how i think about it when it comes to a lot of these uh like play to earn nft based games like there have like there can be a ship that costs fifty thousand dollars but that ship has to be like usable by fifty thousand people who are not paying for it right if if a game needs to have a fifty thousand dollar asset for basically like as uh kind of for you to just be able to play that something's wrong with the game but there's nothing absolutely wrong with games requiring large assets be they planets or spaceships or whatever if it allows a lot of other people to play that game without any cost I think um, I would draw us back to the what we chatted about earlier about being value extractors, right? So if we could just use exactly the same uh, parallel to compare uh, our people who, well, our whales uh, in the games, um, extracting value from the game uh, away from 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 non whales, away from regular players, right? Just because they can go in and they can sweep up a lot of these sort of very uh, high value ex assets. Um, what can be said, uh, there is a reason for these uh, assets to be there. And then obviously, if you actually need to spend 50K just to play the game, then obviously something is very wrong with the game itself, but it is not. Um, there is a reason why I think these studios uh, actually design uh, different assets to be sort of like at different prices um, there has to be different use cases for those assets um, in the game and i think eventually everybody contributes to to the success right uh it's, santi mentioned this it's web3 really it's, it's a what me culture uh, and i think it applies to um, especially to blockchain games as well everybody has a role to play um, those with a lot more resources perhaps buy land perhaps get uh, become landlord and then you know it's 
typical again drawing it back to the real world right i mean does anyone here actually like uh, your landlord if you rent uh, <laughs> right like but these landlords took the risk and not every not every landlord made money right uh, there are many landlords that's lost money as well they took the risk they deserve the reward why you just been investing in in so many early stage games you're not going to make money in every single deal you're going to screw up in most of your deals for sure most of them are not even going to launch but the ones that are going to launch then you know you're going to be king of the world again um and then people you know some people's going to say now nah, why are you just trying to like uh, corner the market they're just buying up all these land and well yeah sure dude but what about those land that we lost what about that game that rugged us what about like no one sees that right so i think i think it's very unfair to make to make these kind of statements i i just think that people people who comment and and say things again crypto twitter referring to you um yeah I mean, just just think about it uh, deeper well, well, one of the things that uh, people forget is that like the value of investors and speculators in the game right like people like to hate on them but there are a lot of players myself included started with a game that when we had assets that were not worth a lot of money and because uh, investors slash speculators came in and kind of bid up the price because they thought that uh, the the assets like Axie Land were worth a certain amount. Now a lot of the early players are actually worth a lot of money in like the Axie asset holdings or like same in other games. So it, it works both ways. Like you as a player come in with your deep knowledge of a game, you buy the assets because you've taken the time to research which games you want to be in. And the funds that are coming in, like they're not going to be too deep into the game or they may not be, they may not be as early, but they can come in with a large amount of money and basically just uh, like uh, lift the, the value of your asset. So that it, it can work both ways, right? No, absolutely. I think that's a really good point, Gabby, which is like, I felt that at least if you look at like the Ethereum community, there's been a lot of value that was created be because of speculation. But a lot of that money gets reinvested into this ecosystem and applications. And so, like, I'm not I'm not like making the stretch like so, some people are just out to extract value like in any system. And so I feel like a lot of the criticisms that we face in crypto are just like like straw man. So it's like, wait a minute, like this happens in the real world, too. Like we're not designing systems that are perfect. But I think the key property here that I always felt like, yeah, you could like it's harder to be a monopoly. It's harder to like like extract rent in an unfair way in web three, because I think the barriers to entry are just lower. Like people just move very quickly from guild to guild. They could just go to another, like the portability of a digital asset is, is, is fast. And so that keeps everyone at least more honest. Like we're not designing a utopia here. Like I think a lot of like OGs in crypto that I uh, always like struggle with like the not very practical kind of like philosophical thinking of people. It's like, wait a minute, like, you're never going to design a perfect system. You make certain trade-offs, but still we are creating better games that are more equitably distributing value to everyone in this attention economy. And that's fine. It's not perfect, but it's, it's at least marginally better than existing games. And I think we're reaching a really interesting point, which is I think the games that I see launching even as early as later this year are going to kind of compete pound for pound on a game lore designed graphics perspective than many of the web two games out there or come very close to it. So I have a take. So a lot of people are thinking that, for example, like for a web three game to be great, like they have to be as good as like a Fortnite or Call of Duty or League of Legends. I think there's really only two components that you uh, like need to get right to have a really good Web3 game. Uh, one is the tokenomics and then the other one is community. And of course, the game mechanics facilitate all of that. What I'm saying is that, for example, graphics, you don't need top-notch like PlayStation 5 level graphics to have a, a great Web3 game. If I wanted immersive lore and I wanted a good story, I would just like boot up the PS5 and play a narrative game, right? What makes a web three game special is actually the combination of the gameplay interacting with the tokenomics and interacting with the community in a way that you can't get in any other type of game coming from pure DeFi, i always felt that like it's hard to convince people like most people are not like thinking about yield farming it's hard as you say gabby there's a very small subset of users that actually interact with these protocols 
and part of the reason why I kind of I'm now so focused on NFTs and particularly gaming is because I think it's make it makes crypto relatable. It makes it abstracts away the complexity, yep. and it it is a great onboarding mechanism and funnel. And my thesis is that that is kind of your first entry point. The minute you discover NFTs, over time, I think in that journey you begin to appreciate digital property um, because you get robbed because you lose it. Like you know, but somehow you discover that and you're like, okay, wow. Or you start playing a game, you're an SLP and say, what else can I do here? And so I've always felt that like perhaps games are are really the ones that tap into the back end, which is DeFi or other services in this whole crypto economy. Web3, Metaverse, whatever you want to call it. So in that frame, I want to understand where, what does YGG, what does Salad look like in the next five, 10 years? Because I think you guys are in a really interesting vantage point where you own the relationship with the user. And if you get that right, you can do so many other things. I think uh, in five to 10 years, um, our focus will still be uh, very much on the infrastructure as well as the education side. Obviously the market will change. Um, but our focus will not. Uh, our objective is still to, uh, and I believe will still be to uh, bring some method to the madness because things just will be very complicated as we talk about X, Y, Z to earn. Um, it's going to be a lot more um, complex because now imagine just playing a game. Everyone's already making such a big fuss about it. Imagine you know everything else. Um, so I think there's always a need um, for for infrastructure uh, and education, and both come hand in hand. Uh, and our focus will, will definitely be beyond that. I think our focus on scholars uh, in the future. We, right right now, we call them scholars in in Peteri because you know YGG coined that many years ago. Um, you know, but in the other X Y Z to earn, uh, we may not be calling them scholars. But I think the relationship uh, that Salad will have with these group of people will still be the same. Um, it would really be to um, get them up to the next level in the game of life um, through what we've built and, and what we teach. Okay, so for us, I, I, I want to be, I guess, uh, try to be uh, like concise about it. Millions of players, billions of dollars worth of assets, hundreds of DAOs, and each of, one, each of them like finding their own like creative job in the metaverse. I always, I, I've, I've been told that I'm always like permeable. So people want me to push back on these things. And you guys know where I stand with all this stuff. But okay, I'll play the the role of being critical, which I think I am, but nonetheless. What can derail us from this vision? Like what can really set us back? Crypto Twitter. <laughs> well, <laughs> other than crypto, I, I should have caveated that. Other than crypto Twitter, um, what are some of the things that you you guys really would say Hey, if this this were to happen, like it would be a really uh, setback to where things are going. For me, the answer for that is regulation, and like, let me qualify that. Like, I don't think we should pretend that regulation shouldn't exist. It will, and mm -hmm. I don't think you should fight it. I think you should actively take it head to head, educate the people who are regulating, maybe even lobby for governance in the real world, and just make sure that people understand the value of having assets in the digital world and how that affects people in the real world. So that's something we think about a lot. And I think that regulation and lobbying, especially for guilds, because they touch people's lives like in a very real manner, mm -hmm. um, is something that uh, yeah, you should be thinking about. Yeah, I, th I think like it's it brings up such a good point because I, I, feel, I share the same sentiment. I felt over and over that, look, not everyone is prepared to have their own keys and do the, and not everyone, it's like how many people open a box, whatever it is, iPhone, any appliance and read the user manual, like 0.001%. And so if you take that same assumption into how people are going to come in a, in, in a crypto, I think there's this expression, which I think is true. People ape in a shit because you know, that that's what they do. And so assuming otherwise, and so I think you just, if you assume that, then you say it places a lot of. I think what you guys are doing is super important from Salad's perspective and, you, and, and YGG, you're educating people, you're creating, you're hand-holding them in this wonderful journey that could be Web3 and discovering all the beautiful properties. And and then people, I think I think that is kind of the, the path forward, which is assuming that people just come in here, set up a ledger and MetaMask and like understand all the, is, is like, it's not going to work. 
But I think in many ways, this is the role and the opportunity that has been created for guilds as a primary onboarding mechanisms into this not central, like, okay, centralized exchange. Yeah, fine. But once you make it through that hop, you guys are kind of more front and center boots on the ground in these communities, in these cities, recruiting people, helping them understand kind of in the same way that Muhammad Yunus kind of created like the Grammy bank and created microloans in many ways, like there's this opportunity for a lot of people to discover web three. And I think you are doing kind of God's work and evangelizing. Um, and, and I think regulators, if anything would love, love what you guys are doing more so than perhaps any other, right. Cause an exchange has kind of like an incentive to just like pump and, you know, look at all the assets that Coinbase is listed. It's just a bunch of garbage. Right. And so it's like, it's just like it, their motivation is, for people to trade and speculate whereas your motivation is no i want to retain this user and i want to create a very friendly experience for them to understand it educate them and the lifetime value of the customer like you take a much more long-term view on that by educating them which i think is great there's, there's a lot of loyalty and even love for a guild that you're not going to find for an exchange for example and i think you know the first decade or so of of onboarding into crypto has been via exchanges. And I think the next decade will really be about guilds, like different sorts of guilds. But at the end of the day, if you want mass adoption, then you want the masses to be here, not only the people who have money. And guilds are by far the best way to do that. I think nothing will stop this um, will stop this thing uh, to from from happening, you know, because uh, the ships already sailed, um, and regulation is part and parcel of of evolution, right? So uh, it 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 will come, um, and it should come, um, and uh, you know the. Uh, the regulator who is uh, sort of the most creative um, in, in in regulating this uh, industry, as as we may call it, uh, will will just benefit the most. Will their, their country, their jurisdiction, will benefit the most because everybody will naturally just flock there, um, right? So I think regulators are also as um, you know, as confused, but they are also competing uh, amongst other regulators to come up with the strongest uh, that to protect their people, but at the same time, not to be so strong such that um, they push away uh, potential growth of their, their own economy, their various economy, whether it's, uh, you know, Hong Kong, Dubai, Singapore, Philippines, don't know. Um, yeah, so I think it will come. And I think also, um, like, like, like what Gabi said, I think there will be a lot more guilds. They may be called something else in the future, uh, but it's really a labor force, a people who who starts to organize people to do organized work uh, together. Um, they'll start copying. Uh, some of them will start copying the YGG model. Others will start copying what Salad's building. And I think it's good, right? I just sent out a tweet today or yesterday. I can't remember. Um, nobody copies a shit product, right? I mean, it's good if they are actually copying us uh, and there's more and more of us. And that's what, brings about real change, right? So so you need more guild owners, you need more guild managers, you need these guys to know what they're doing. Um, I think if there's anything that, that will stop us is, is you get a lot of bad, you get more bad actors into the scene than, you know, people who actually want to make a decent, decent living, living, start a proper business, change people's lives. Um, but I don't think that's gonna, that's gonna happen. So nothing's gonna stop the ship silt. I love that. Guys, thanks so much for coming on. I mean, I, I uh, in full disclosure, I mean, I'm an investor in both of your companies. So, you know, like still, uh, I think this is objective. And I think it's a great discussion for anyone to just understand why this movement matters, uh, whether you believe in it or not. But I think it's worth the conversation. And, and hopefully this could be a good guide uh, for people to um, to discover some of the really cool stuff uh, that's happening in this industry. Um before we go, what's the best, uh, maybe both of you can just tell us what's the best way to find you, learn more about, uh, you know, YGG and Salad uh, for anyone that wants to learn more. For us, it's twitter.com slash yield or discord.gg slash YGG. Yeah, for us, you go to Twitter and look for at Salad Ventures, or if you want to follow uh, my account, it's at Felix Sim, that's S-I-M. Fantastic. We'll link it also in the show notes for everyone. Uh, gents, thanks so much for coming on. I really, really enjoyed this conversation um, and appreciate the time. It was fun. Likewise. Thanks, Gabby. Thanks, Felix.